So we're starting the rate of reaction unit. I'm going to be using the uh, Advanced Science AP Chem 2 book uh, as our sequence as we work our, through, our way through this unit. Our first theme is going to be an introduction to rate of reaction. We're going to lightly get a lot of themes today, but we're not going to go deep into them. So we're going to get the typical relationship. We get uh, a mathematical expression for rates, and then in future lessons, we'll learn how to derive those rates. Uh, and then at the end of the unit, we'll collect the data ourselves and derive the rates from experimental data. So again, lots of intro stuff. Uh, so first, talking a little bit about balanced chemical equations. A big skill from uh, grade 10 to 11 that you can balance equations, but they don't help us very much. I'm going to write an equation for gold reacting with hydrochloric acid. And these were the heart of how we understood chemical reactions in the past. Okay. We're going to have a, a big change with this unit. Balanced chemical equations still give us some stoichiometric data. They'll help us convert rates. So if we know how fast gold is reacting, okay, that too is going to give us some information in the hydrochloric acid about how fast it's reacting. But balanced chemical equations give us no useful information overall about rates. You know, we look at this, does this happen in 10 seconds, 2 minutes, 5 years? None of that information is contained here. Okay? Nor does this even tell us anything about the kinetics. Okay? Uh, we will want to know about fast steps and slow steps in this unit. So we'll break reactions like this down. I mean, not this particular one, into maybe two or three parts and understand what part happens first, what happens second, and the slow step is the one that we really care about. Okay? When we talk about rate laws, okay, these coefficients aren't even going to predict the rate laws. Okay? So a big step away from balanced chemical equations in this unit. We're going to start writing uh, sort of some rate equations now. Okay. Chemical kinetics, which is what we're studying, convey how fast something will occur. So we're going to have time units all the time. We might have moles per liter per second, big M per second. Okay. Or we'll have rate constants, K, that will tell us some information about how fast things occur. A little bit of formatting of how rates are expressed. And I'm just laying out A is turning into B, A is reactant, B is product. That's the point of me writing that out, uh, simplifying a reaction. Okay. We're going to write expressions for rates. We're going to calculate rates. Okay. So we may want to look at the change in concentration of B. We could do that, again, in moles per liter. We could do it in pressure units. Okay. If it was a solid, maybe we'll measure grams at the beginning, grams at the end. There's a lot of units you can use for that. And for sort of our first time, we're going to be looking at per unit time now. How fast does that happen? Rates are always going to be expressed as a positive number. So if we were, we could use the rate of production of B, over time to get the rate, we could do something similar with the reactant. But with reactants, they're going to be decreasing over time. So when we want to use reactants to back figure out an overall rate, there's going to be a negative placed in front. The rates are going to be defined as a positive value. So the products are going to be formed. They'll be positive by default. The reactants, the change in concentration will be negative, And we want to compare that back to an overall rate. You'll see a negative sign. 
Okay. We'll talk about the stoichiometric coefficients and how they affect converting between uh, using up A or making B shortly. Okay. Some factors, and we'll dive, again, this is an intro, we'll dive deeper into these factors over time. So some factors that affect the rate of reaction. Surface area is a uh, major factor. Okay. All of our group one and two metals are so reactive, they'll react just with water. So calcium metal will react with water and make calcium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. I'll just leave that. I won't bother balancing it so I know that's unbalanced. So one thing, you we've got a solid here, and you're probably used to this. You've experienced it maybe in an elementary school lab. If you cut up a solid into pieces, so you turn it into a powder, it's going to react much faster than if it's just a big chunk. Concentrations, we don't have any aqueous solutions, but if you have a higher concentration of an aqueous substance or a gas, okay. so this could be our usual C, uh, pressures are really just a proxy for concentration. If the pressure is higher, uh, the concentration uh, is higher. Temperature has a big effect, uh, and maybe unusually large. Okay. Temperature affects two things that increase this rate of reaction, and we'll talk about those uh, in a future slide and lesson. Okay. And then particularly through biology, you've probably talked a fair bit about catalysts. We've talked about catalysts in, in regular chem 30 in equilibrium. There are substances that speed up the rate of reaction, and there's lots of ways that they can do that. So there's no one way to talk about how catalysts affect rates of reaction. Okay. Those are sort of the, the main ways that we can affect rate of reaction, not all of them. Okay? Again, temperature probably being one of the biggest. Why we cook our food is just to increase rate of reaction, and it's very sensitive to temperature. Some of the ways that we can measure rates. Okay? So you could weigh. If you have a solid made or used up, you could be weighing that solid over time. Often it's hard to measure masses, particularly as products on the fly. An easy way you could measure mass of a reaction if you have a combustion reaction of a candle and you have that whole candle sitting on a scale, you could be measuring the decrease in the candle wax or the fuel over time. Or if you had any burner sitting on a, a scale, you could measure the mass go down and get grams per second as the reactant is used up. Okay. Volumes probably of gases, not of liquids. Okay. Here you might have a gas formed like we do in the calcium and water reaction, and if you could collect that gas and measure its volume over time, that's one way you could study the, the rate of reaction. Okay. Concentrations, you probably need some sort of device measuring concentration over time, some sort of probe. Okay. The easiest one is to measure H3O plus concentration over time, because you can just use a pH probe to measure that concentration over time. And that's something we have data logged, and then you can buy data logging pH probes. Okay. Color can be measured over time. In Chem 20, we did a Beer's Law AP lab. They're devices that quantify how intense a color is, and you can data log the color over time how blue is a solution or how pink is a solution. Okay. That's in the realm of spectrometry. Okay. And pressure. This is one in our school we're going to use a lot uh, in our labs. We have pressure probes so we can run reactions, 
seal the top of the vessel, connect the pressure probe, and measure the kilopascals over time. Okay. And last, we can do this in our school. I have not done it in the past, but measure connectivity. If you had a solution with no ions and one of the products is a soluble ionic compound, you can measure the increase in connectivity over time. Okay. This doesn't necessarily work if you have a certain concentration of ions at the beginning and different ions at the end, but the concentration's the same, the probe wouldn't pick it up. So you have to either be uh, precipitating out ions or making them in order for connectivity to work. This one can be quite challenging uh, with the, the new and the old ions coming and going. So these are, are some of the many factors. Looking at a different reaction and kind of labeling all the factors that we could measure. So copper, elemental copper reacting with hydrochloric acid, producing copper two uh, chloride and hydrogen gas. Okay. There are so many things we could possibly pick to measure the rate of reaction. So copper, we could potentially weigh it. We would probably want to have not a powder, but a chunk. If you had a solid stick of copper, okay. maybe you'd have to take it out of your solution, weigh it every five minutes, put it back in and continue it. And you could get its mass over time. Okay. Hydrochloric acid, okay. right in the name, it's an acid. There's nothing acidic on the product side, so the only thing that's going to affect pH would be our hydrochloric acid, so we can measure that over time. We would be uh, losing an acid, so making the solution less acidic, so we should see the pH increase over time. And when it runs out, would be at or very close to seven. this product. Okay. Now in our Chem 30 data booklet, we have colors of a whole bunch of ions. In AP, we don't have that data booklet, uh, but if there's one color I hope a student gets used to is uh, that copper is a nice blue color. Copper, two ions are blue. In Chem 20, when you first learn to make solutions, we use copper uh, sulfate or copper two sulfate, and it made that nice blue solution in Chem 20. Okay. So I'm pointing at the copper to chloride, but chloride is clear, so there's no way to use color with chloride, and a lot of ions on, are clear, and this doesn't work, okay. but there are many ions that it does work. Permanganate, dichromate, iron-2, iron-3, they all have colors that you could study. Okay. And then last, if you make hydrogen gas, you can measure uh, the volume of this gas or pressure of this gas. And again, at our school, pressure is the easiest thing that we have the equipment to measure. Volume of gas being produced can be tricky uh, to measure. So just an example of how a, a, a single replacement reaction can give lots of options to measure rates. Okay. We're going to jump into the more mathematical side, and there's two different types of rates that you have to be able to deal with. Instantaneous rates, so what is the rate of reaction? in that fraction of a second or average rates. So we've got some data for the reaction of uh, bromine with formic acid. Okay, so this would be elemental bromine. Formic acid is also known as methanoic acid, so meth one carbon. So we've one carbon, and then we got that OOH of a carboxylic acid, and then we just need one other H to go with that front carbon. I'm not going to balance this or put the products out. I don't even want to balance it and put the products out, because unfortunately, the stoichiometric coefficients that would go with this reaction don't tell us things about rate laws. We're going to have to learn different techniques to to develop rate laws. 
They still would tell us stoic, but not rates. Okay. So we've got some data collected, and I'd like you to grab maybe at least the first four rows in your notes. Okay. And we're going to do a calculation. You've already should be used to calculating average rates or have that math background, but I'll do an example quickly of average rates. And in the bottom, we'll do some graphical formats for instantaneous rates. So I'm going to calculate a rate of reaction, and the only way I or we can calculate a rate is using the concentration of bromine. That's the only chemical we have. So the rate of change of bromine, I'm going to use its concentration. Time and we're going to do average rates here. So when you do an average rate, you have to pick the time that you're going to do your average over. So we're going to do the average for the first 50 seconds. And then we'll talk about the rates that are in the table already. They're not average rates. So what is the, cha uh, the change in bromine concentration? So the final minus the initial is how we're going to calculate all of our changes. If it was a reactant, when we do finus minus initial, you have that extra minus put in to flip the sign to be positive. So bromine is 0 0.0101 moles per liter minus 0 0.0120 moles per liter. Okay. This is a reactant, so we add a minus in front to convert our negative rate into positive rates, and that's just a convention. Okay. So, so does the top make sense to everyone? We're just going to do the same thing on the bottom. Again, this is something you probably did in many uh, earlier grades in, in math. Time. 50 seconds minus zero seconds. And we get a little under four times 10 to minus five moles per liter per second. Okay. So fairly. Uh, slow rate of change. Okay. So this is an average rate. Okay. Depending on the time frame you pick, you're going to get different average rates. It's not a constant throughout the whole reaction. Okay. This rate in the column are instantaneous rates. Okay. Not averaging over the first 30 seconds or 50 seconds or 100 seconds, but what is the rate right at zero seconds? Okay. And we actually see a rate that's a little faster than our average, okay. 4.2 times 10 to minus 5. If we look at our data, 3.8 times 10 to minus 5, that kind of fits in between the instantaneous rate at zero and 50 seconds. And that's always going to happen. Average rates are going to fit in the middle of the instantaneous data at the beginning and at the end. Okay. And overall, what is going on with our rates? Okay. They're all 10 to the minus 5. And we're starting in the 4s. Okay. And by 400 seconds, the rate is over four times lower. This reaction is slowing down over time. And that's what pretty much always happens in reactions. Over time, they slow down. The biggest reason for this is you've got less and less chemicals. Concentrations are a big contributor to rate of reaction. I would assume temperature is probably being held constant, and our concentration is going down over time. And if there's less and less chemicals to react, the reaction goes slower and slower and slower over time. Okay. 
So this is not an anomaly to our data. This is what we expect. If we kept doing average rates, we're not going to, but we could do average for another 50 second segment. That would be slower. If we did the bottom 50 second segment, that average rate would get even slower again. Okay. So average rates are just final minus initial over some time frame. Okay. How do we get these instantaneous rates? The, this is a, a graphing skill. So I'll pause for a second. If you want to get down this rough sketch, now I got the black lines I'm going to move around. We're heading towards slope shortly. So don't put the black lines in until I move them to the right place. Okay. So instantaneous rates are done in an instant. We can't do any averages. How would we get the instantaneous rate at time equals zero? you're going to have to take a tangent to that point. So a tangent is a straight line, and the line is equal distant to your actual data line uh, before and after the data. Now, we don't have any sort of negative time data, so it's a little harder to do tangents at the very beginning. But you're trying to get what, right at this red dot, what is the slope of the line over that centimeter or millimeter? So you would have to draw a tangent. You'll be doing this with experimental data. You would adjust the slope of that black line to most mimic the slope of the blue line that's hidden at that dot. And then to get the instantaneous rate, you're going to do this is probably science 10, sorry, math 10 or grade 9. Math, you're going to do the rise over the run on your tangent. Doesn't matter what size you make your triangle, the ratio of rise over run will be the same. Okay. The, you're going to have to carry your units forward. Okay. So the units for rise are, are going to be some concentration or maybe grams, and the run is going to be time. Okay. If we wanted to do the instantaneous slope at a later time, I think that's 250 seconds, you're going to have to do a different tangent. So you're going to have to put a straight line at that point and you're minimizing the distance of your line sort of coming in and out of uh, before and after your actual data point. Okay? This black line should have the same slope as this blue line right at the green point. So watch on an assessment. I could ask you to do average rate or uh, less so on a test, but definitely with lab data. So we're going to be data logging experimental reactions. You're going to want to plot the data. You're not going to take average just of your data. You're going to take instantaneous rates, and the rates that we're going to be using are going to be the ones at the very beginning in our labs. So I mentioned that K rate constant earlier. I just want to give a little bit of lead into rate laws, but we're not going to really dive into this for a couple lessons ahead. And the next lesson, we'll likely touch on this again. So the rate of reaction, which we just saw a whole bunch of data, whether it was averages or instantaneous, varies with concentration. So rates are not constant. There's no table of rates. Okay. You can't take a reaction, go to a data sheet, and find, okay, methane with oxygen, here's the rate of reaction in the table. Okay, that doesn't exist. It's a variable. However, there is a rate constant for a particular reaction. And the word constant is right in its name. It is a value that doesn't change. It's a fundamental constant for that reaction. Okay. Just same as thermodynamics. It is true for a given temperature. So rate constants are temperature dependent. But if you always re react methanol with oxygen, 
under the same conditions, there is a constant that explains or we can use to understand the rate of reaction. So our rate of reaction, which is a variable, we can get from a rate constant. And then we're going to have concentration factors. Now, I only put one chemical into this rate law. There might be two reactants that show up in the rate law. Okay? There might be three. Okay? And we're also not talking about the coefficients. You might have to square that bromine. You might have to cube it. It might just be to one power. Okay? And the power here is not the stoichiometric coefficient. They're experimentally determined. They're determined from the slow step. Okay? There might be two bromine in the reaction stoichiometrically thinking, but only one of them might be in the slow step, in which case you'll see a single power there. Okay. But fundamentally, rate laws are a constant times a concentration piece, and the concentration piece might have powers. Last bit, sort of going back to the start. Okay. In chemical kinetics, we want to be able to write rates we can determine rates for individual chemicals, and we need to be able to switch from one chemical to another. Okay. Reactants, we're all going to put a minus in front, okay. and they're all going to have different stoichiometric amounts, and those amounts we're going to use in converting one chemical into another. Not every chemical reacts at the same rate. So using same as equilibrium, sort of a generic form of a reaction. So A amount, stoichiometric of little a amount of A can react with B amount of B chemical. I'm going to talk about how you could relate the A chemical reacting versus the B versus the C versus the D and calculating sort of this constant rate for the, for the reaction at a given point. So to get the rate for chemical A, first off, we're going to have a minus to flip the fact that we're using it up to make it positive. I'm leaving a little bit of space there. I'm going to come back to this. So leave a little gap after the minus. We've got the change in the concentration of A with respect to time. And we're going to scale all of these chemicals by one over how many of that chemical reacts. So if there was a stoichiometric coefficient of two, we're going to scale it down to as if there was one for any chemical in, in comparing A to B or A to C or C to D. Okay. This will make more sense when I get to an example. It's, it's going to do what we expect stoichiometry to do. Okay. So for chemical B, over time to compare its rate to A, okay. it's another reactant. We're going to have a minus. And to scale chemical A to chemical B, we're going to have 1 over chemical A or 1 over chemical B. We want to compare that or use chemical C for a calculation. C is a product, so we're not going to have that minus in front. It's going to be 1 over little c. So I'm going to jump right into an example. You don't actually even need to use this formula to compare rates. It does always work, but we can use our, our 
Chem 20 stoic skill intuition. If, if another chemical has a two coefficient compared to a chemical that has a one, if something is being made two of them compared to one, we're going to see that other chemical being made twice as fast. The rate will be twice as fast. All of these one over coefficients is line up. What we should already know is that something's going to be made twice as fast or three times faster or maybe half as much. So let's see that play out and have our intuition match what kind of looks like weird math. It, it, the one over typically feels like it's wrong. So what is the rate of production of water if methane is combusted at a rate of one uh, mole per liter per second? Well, if we're going to compare water to methane, we need the stoichiometric coefficients for water and methane, so we need a whole balanced chemical equation. So what, uh, methane and oxygen is going to make us carbon dioxide and water. When we balance this, you start by balancing your hydrogen. We end up with four O's on the product side after we balance our, our hydrogen, and then we can balance our oxygen. Carbon has one and one. There's one on both sides, one methane, one carbon dioxide. So we're given the change in concentration of methane with respect to time being consumed, so that's minus. Okay. I didn't put the minus in my number, but I put the, um, the fact it's being combusted or used up in the language of the question. So we're going to do this two ways. Quickly we'll, quickly, we'll just use what we know from stoichiometry. One methane makes two waters. So the water, two of these are made for every one of those that are reacted. So if this concentration goes down by one mole per liter, this is going to go up double. So we should get two moles per liter. Uh, now, this is moles per liter per second. This is going to double to two moles per liter per second. And that's what those inverse coefficients let us do. So I'm going to use the coefficient method, the change in concentration of methane. Okay, and I just want to compare that to water. No, I haven't put the coefficients in yet. The left is what we know mathematically, the right we don't. This isn't equal yet because we haven't factored in the stoic. Our methane is one over, its stoichiometric coefficient is one, and it's a reactant, so we have a minus. Our product is water, so that's going to be one over two, and it's a product, so no minus. Okay. So I'm going to solve this for the change in concentration of water. So to get this by itself, I've got to get rid of that red two. So I'm just going to multiply both sides by 2. So we're left with just our changing concentration of water over time. So we've got 2 times minus I'm not going to put the 1 over 1, and our concentration is minus 1.0 moles per liter per second. So we have our 2 minuses, 2 times 1 mole per liter per second is 2.0 moles per liter per second. 
and that's a change in concentration of water. So in order to correctly factor in the stoic, we have to use one over the coefficients, converting from one rate to another, not them as numerators. They've got to be denominators. That's what sets the math up. Okay. But again, you could do this. Your chem 20 required over given ratios are still going to work. Okay. So if you want to do it kind of the chem 20 way, that's fine but all the AP resources that I see are setting it up like this. So I want you to know what that looks like if you look at any of the books. We're using Advantage, but Chang AP textbook sets it up. Every AP book sets it up this way. One other example, we're gonna do a little, uh, a little more stoic in with our rates. So if six, little over 16 grams of methane reacted in 10 minutes, what is the rate of water vapor produced? But we want it in liters per minute. So we're gonna have to do some chem 20 stoic conversion. We're not gonna do it in grams. I'm just going to pull down that balanced chemical equation so it's nice and visible. I'm going to leave out the states this time. We have them up above. So we're told there's 16.05 grams of methane. And we want to convert that to a rate of water vapor being produced, but we want liters per minute, liters of gas formed. We know there's going to be a one turning into a two, so a doubling of the rate. And we just have to go back to Chem 20 and our gases, which might be a little rusty, that Chem 20 gas unit, and converting moles into liters. So I'm going to start with moles here. That's a pure substance, so mass over molar mass would give us our moles. Sixteen point oh five grams divided by the molar mass of methane is also sixteen point oh five. What a coincidence. So this question had exactly one mole of methane. How much water vapor is it going to produce? Well, one methane is going to make two waters. So we're going to get two moles of methane produced. I'm just using sort of our chem 20 stoic. If we used our ratios up here, we'd still get moles. I haven't, I liked, I'm going to do the time part at the end. Okay. We could have went moles per minute here and converted this to moles per minute. I'm just, but I just think it's cleaner to do the time at the end. Now, do we remember anything about Chem 20? How do we convert moles to liters? Okay. okay. So reviewing some gases, PV equals NRT. Okay. So you could figure out the volume. We know the moles. Okay. We could remind ourselves of SATP pressure and temperature and look up the universal gas law constant and get it that way. Or since we're at the constant, molar volume, which is volume per mole, is a always the same number, Vm. At STP, which isn't this question, it's 22.4 liters per mole. That's standard ambient temperature and pressure. So uh, standard temperature is zero Celsius. SATP is 25 degrees Celsius. It's a bit hotter. So one mole of a gas is expanded a bit at SATP because it's hotter and it's up to 24.8. 
Now, it doesn't matter the gases, kinetic molecular theory from Chem 20, whether you have hydrogen gas or helium or oxygen or nitrogen, as long as it acts as an ideal gas, it's always going to have the same volume for the same amount of moles, okay? assuming they're not sticking together, intermolecular forces aren't pulling them together, and there's no chemical reaction. Okay. So we can fairly quickly go from moles to volume. Molar volume. We want to get the volume. So the volume of water vapor, which is double, uh, has double the moles of our methane. We're going to get 24.8 liters for every mole. We're going to have two moles. We're going to have 49.6 liters. Now, at some point, I had to figure in the rate. Again, I could have done it at the very beginning, begin, beginning and went one mole per 10 minutes, but now I'm going to get the rate for water. We've 20. 49.6 liters, and everything has happened in 10 minutes. So what is our average rate? 4.96 liters per minute. Okay. Again, this is an average. If you're collecting the data, you would have found it a little faster than average at the beginning, and you'd be a little slower than average at the 10 minutes, potentially. But this is our average. So that's our intro into uh, rate of reaction. We've gone through the advantage uh, first two chapters. Okay. Deeper dive into rate laws is coming. There's two particular different categories of rates that we're going to study, first order kinetics and second order kinetics, and get into the, the math of predicting concentrations versus time for first order versus second order, which are not uh, the same. So the questions from Edgevantage that you can take a look at are there. If you want extra practice, uh, the Blue Chang book has some practice there, but you don't have to use that book.